Hi, welcome to another episode of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Thank you for joining us. We've got quite a uh, quite a program for you today. We have uh, uh, a lady who has been uh, quoted as being the female Michael Jordan. And believe me, that when I read that and then read into uh, her uh, both uh, professional career and uh, as well as uh, off the field, uh, I certainly remembered her very well from her college days at the University of Tennessee. And I know a lot of you that uh, are uh, uh, women basketball fans, NCAA, WNBA, uh, will remember this young lady. A basketball superstar uh, who is, uh, besides uh, having uh, the world, uh, you might say, almost on a little silver platter, uh, as I've said with other guests we've had on, sometimes uh, not all is, uh, is perfect in the world, you know, and uh, she has uh, uh, battled uh, uh, mental illness in her life and uh, now is trying to uh, uh, educate and also enlighten people uh, to better understand mental illness and uh, while at the same time uh, traveling uh, to uh, her own recovery. And we, uh, we welcome uh, Ms. Shamiqua Holst, Claw. Shamiqua, uh, thank you for joining us. How are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, Larry. I appreciate it. And, you know, I was, I was looking at some notes the other day, and I'm thinking to myself, I think that um, you were the, uh, the, the cog, you as well as Coach, uh, Coach Summit, uh, that was uh, the thorn in the University of Connecticut because your three NCAA championships, didn't that come after the Rebecca Lobo, Jen Rosati one in 95? Oh, 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 definitely. You know the UConn, Tennessee, uh, you know how it goes. It was UConn. Then it was the host Claude Ketchens era. Then it was the Diana Taurasi's era. And then it went back to Candace Parker. We just keep flip-flopping. They had, they had a few, well, lean years in the sense that, you know, nowadays people don't understand. You don't get to the, uh, you know, to the big dance every year. But here, you know, uh, in this part of the country, and I'm sure even down in Tennessee and during the years you were there and afterwards, it's like, oh, my God, that, that's, you know, like you know something something catastrophic has happened you know but uh, but you guys you know three in a row and now were you the the first uh, 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 women's basketball team to uh, pull the uh, trifecta oh yeah the three in a row we're the only we're uh, the only team I the, think the University of Tennessee and maybe UConn and UConn, Atlanta. UConn I think has actually yeah, done it since then as well okay. yeah All but right. they they actually went uh, I'm trying to remember, I thought it was during the Renee Montgomery years, this would have been uh, way after when you were already in the WNBA, okay. but they went a stretch where they actually went like an entire like freshman to senior class where they didn't have a championship and you would have thought the wheels were falling off, <laughs> off the spokes. Um, Born in uh, Queens, New York. Again, that's something I didn't know. We were talking off air a little bit. Uh, uh, you try to get back uh, to the, uh, the area uh, now and again. Um, you were a high school basketball star at Christ the King High School. Yes, in Middle Village. Yeah. Um, offhand, I know I looked up. I thought Lou Alcindor, later Kareem Abdul, was from Christ the King, but he went to uh, a Catholic school called Power uh, back in the day, yeah. But uh, uh, any uh, any other notables that you recall from Christ well, the King? Well, um, back in the day, we had uh, Derek Phelps and Brian Reeves at the University of North Carolina. First round pick, Khalid Reeves. Uh, we had uh, Jason Williams that played for the New York Nets. He, he played there. We had Lamar Odom, uh, Eric Barkley, who was also a first rounder, and Speedy Claxton, who was a, another first rounder. So we've had like a lot of great male players. On the female side, we've had three number one draft picks, uh, myself, Sue Bird, and Tina Charles. And I know from the teams that I played on at Christ the King, we talk about 12 young ladies on a team, at least 10 or 11 of them are walking away with college scholarships. So they're getting it done on and off the court. I was going to say, Sue Bird and Tina Charles, uh, um, I know you probably played against Sue Bird. I'm not sure Tina Charles was in the league at that point you got out, but... Again, uh, uh, that's that's probably where I had heard the uh, you know the high school from was was from that that point there a couple of uh, yes. UConn alums there. Um, you played a total of what a parts of uh, almost ten years in the league, correct? Um, I played uh, 11, 11 years in Europe. So you know I, I've journeyed, I've journeyed the world and had a great experience. And now also one thing I forgot to tell uh, uh, the viewers too a 
Yeah, very impressive indeed. 2000 in Sydney. Uh, who was the coach on that team that year? Um, it was it was uh, Nell Fortner. Um, she had us the whole year. She did a tremendous job on you know making the team gel, all the different personalities, and we just went out there and competed. It was unreal. I mean, just to see all those people packing uh, a stadium, you know, cheering on women's basketball, and just to see how the divide is. You know, you have China in this section, America here. But everybody's just rooting. It was it was uh, surreal. You find that uh, from your experience then, and and uh, perhaps you've you've kept up a little bit with it as far as the you know the box score um, has the what's the word I'm looking for the 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 talent uh, elevated itself worldwide to perhaps the the divide between you know how a lot of times the US would just roll in like the dream team of the men's in 92 they just roll in and just basically barely show up and and you know there's no competition I mean do you find that the competition factor has really improved throughout the other countries oh yeah it, it has improved well first of all you have to think of it it's improved because a lot of us Americans we go over there um, that's where WNBA players make their money. So we go over there in the off season, and we're over there playing with a lot of these players uh, six to seven months out of the out of the year. And then now with women's basketball, we have a lot of times where we're getting passports. If you haven't played in the U.S. system, you can get passports to other country. I don't know if you're familiar with a, a player uh, called uh, what's her name uh, Becky Hammond. Yes. She's American born. She played for Russia. So if you you know you have Russia American, she's an American player who's able to go out there and play against Americans and elevate her team. So it, it you know, makes the competition better. And and part of that, too, I mean, it, I'm sure it's great from a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a cultural standpoint, both, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, nurturing in terms of being able to see the world. But again, face it, a lot of that, too, is because the, the money uh, is so much better out there playing for some of those teams. Right. I mean, I mean I you can say, all right, you're a high-level WNBA player. You're making ninety to 100000 uh in, say, four months. Okay, that's not bad. You can't really complain about that. But when you can go to Europe in, in seven months, you know, make sometimes, some players five times more, some players ten times more, it's, it's a big difference. So what we're seeing now is players aren't coming back to the States. The European teams are paying them to stay away from the WNBA. I mean, you look at Diana Taurasi, a, a UConn alumni, she, I think she was offered like 1.5 million not to play in the WNBA. Right. So literally like 15, 15 times what she would make, <laughs> and that's you know again even with some endorsements, which I'm sure is a is a separate entity anyway. Um, how are they able to do that? I know when I was thinking of that question during my notes, I, I thought is it because they have a lot more like. Um, advertising logos on the uniforms or throughout the the arena itself well when or, you talk about european basketball uh you don't i mean she she's playing in russia i mean you know russia you don't know who owns the team right as far as the business is it could be major corporations you, you you know you don't know the rules i mean it could be the billionaire guy that owned the the new jersey nets you know they have that whole thing but the thing is they're able to pay this um, they do have endorsements on the uniforms, and we're not playing. Um, the Russian arenas aren't small arenas. They they have arenas that like seat you know twenty thousand people, and they're packed. So it's it's a big fanfare. Yeah. Whereas just as a comparison, I don't have the exact figure, but the um, the one here in Connecticut where the Connecticut Sun play, mm -hmm. I would say max ten eleven thousand. I don't even know. It might even be eight thousand. So again. There's a big difference there, and to be honest with you, too, sometimes the support level is not the same. Whereas there, both with men and women, and in so many of the sports, uh, right. and even in some of the third world countries, I hear, you know, India now is trying to get a team, and, and China, of course, you know, you see some of the, the male athletes that have come out of there. I haven't seen any females yet, any uh, that, you, that you know of? Or? They, they would had one early on in uh, the WNBA. She was like six nine, um, Haisha. But the thing is, is that now these these younger the the, the Chinese. I was in China uh, maybe two years ago. What they're doing is bringing American coaches are over. They're training these kids now, um, training them the way you know we practice, the way that we play. And now they're able to come to the states and go to school and kind of like take over things here because they have a different discipline and different you know structure level they, right. they want to learn whereas 
some of the kids in the states we're kind of like falling off a little bit in basketball is because we play AAU basketball we're not working as hard we don't have that discipline and, and structure and if you think about it a lot of people got mad at Kobe Bryant when he said it like he's he said it American basketball youth basketball sucks <laughs> yeah you know yeah and again I'm sure that like I said the uh especially in some of the countries like China I mean I just uh, the the support from the regional or the head government is you know a lot of money is being poured in I'll give you an example I just read a story the other day where um, uh, in China they are importing even some coaches not necessarily on the pro level but coaches people that they respect or that, that are willing to come over there because they want all of a sudden compete for the gold medal in soccer and, and it's almost kind of laughable at first because uh, soccer just like basketball you just don't like you know get it just because you got an American coach doesn't mean oh well we're gonna we're gonna turn it around like that and whoever the the head government is out there wants to have a team that's gold medal ready by the time the Olympics or whatever is going to be in in or near Beijing and and like or or even the World Cup I think uh, that as well so I mean it's almost like what are we trying to buy a championship <laughs> They have they have the funds, you know. Yeah. So that they, that's what they're doing, you know. I mean, I was over there two years ago, and I had a chance to run into a good friend of mine, Stephon Marbury. You know, he was a, a big time first round of NBA player. And a former uh, came Nick, the yeah. Same year, and Steph said, "I would never leave China. I would never leave. I'm going to coach the national team here. Every place I went in China is Marbury, Marbury, Marbury. He makes more money, like off the court, like his NBA salary off the court." He had a candy bar here. How, how it can't be that much better. <laughs> he had sneakers here. I mean, my goodness. He had cheesecake at Juniors. You know, Juniors. Yeah, at Brooklyn, yeah. They had the strawberry cheesecake. There you go. There you go. Now another one that uh, uh, maybe age caught up. I don't know, but uh, Allen Iverson kind of. I didn't get the same impression that he was either was able to embrace either the culture. It's kind of like basket uh, baseball players years ago and even today. A lot of them go to China or Japan, I should say, where, of course, baseball is like, you know, it's like, you know, here's a, here's a bottle as you're a kid, here's a bat. You know, they start them young. And a lot of them, because of the cultural differences, the language and everything, are not able to adapt. Right. And so I wonder sometimes maybe if like an Allen Iverson, in his case, I believe he was in China or Russia, and again, just couldn't adapt. So it's... Uh, let me, let me tell you, Allen Iverson went to Turkey. Allen Iverson was in Istanbul, one of my favorite players. It's like places. It's like New York City. Every American wants to play in Istanbul, Turkey. Now, I just think it was a personal thing for Allen Iverson. I think he wanted to be in the WNBA. I mean, sorry, WNBA, the NBA. Yeah. Um, he felt slighted. He wanted to get back. He was being spoiled. That's, that's my sure. opinion. <laughs> yeah, and now in his case... Uh, obviously, he made pretty good coin during his career. Right. Whether they all keep it, that's another story, as you well know. I mean, there's so many Antoine Walker. I mean, we could do a whole show on on the financial implications of, of playing in the NBA. Um, good pay, but not always the, the soundest uh, advice as far as keeping it. But right. um, uh, how was the, the pay for the men uh, playing in, in, uh, in those foreign countries? Oh, wow. For the men, you have, uh, you know, friends of mine that are make, have multi-million dollar contracts. Yeah. Especially like the Russian team. There's a player called uh, Todd, Todd Holden. Um, he, I think he played at Cornell University. Right. And they called him the Black Russian. You know, he won a couple uh, titles over there. He was making, you know, maybe two to three million dollars, if I'm not mistaken, a year. So he didn't even go to the NBA. He basically just boom went right yeah. over there, and then so uh, you talk about playing in Russia. They're giving you like an amazing house to live in. You have a you have a driver. Only thing you are probably a cook, a chef. You're living the life. <laughs> we need to make a call to Todd see if the Knicks might be able to get him because the because <laughs> the I'll, I'll take Iverson at this point. I mean, the Knicks need a lot of help. <laughs> Like, I think it's, I was reading something, it was like 18 years ago was the last time the, the Knicks competed for like an Eastern Conference final. 18 years 18 ago. 18 or maybe 20. I know that 94, because I remember watching, there was a great story um, that uh, they were playing a game, and I want to say it might have been against the Miami Heat. It was at the Garden, mm -hmm. and it was the same day that the OJ chase was going on. 
So there were more people at the concession stands, which of course now everything's more modern now, but think about 18, 20 years ago, cell phones weren't where they were or whatever. And in between the second and third period, halftime, whatever, all of a sudden there were people out there watching the Bronco and they were like, wait a minute, where do all the people go? They're all like, I'm not even ordering a hot dog or a drink. I'm watching this. This is more exciting than the game. So that I remember was like one of the last times the Knicks got into the playoffs and then of course hey the Ewing era ended and it's been it's been a, a, a tough slide ever since mm -hmm. you know and then uh, we keep bringing Isaiah Thomas back I don't know but Shamiqua Holesclaw joining us for the hour here on Studio 411 talking about her uh, marvelous career as I said before I actually uh, came upon this uh, about a day or two ago and again nothing but high praise of the female Michael Jordan and that jogged the memory of mine of like watching the news back in the day and all of a sudden seeing like this footage of this woman tearing it up at Tennessee and just like, <laughs> I, I mean, you have no idea. I mean, it didn't even have to be a UConn game. They would show highlights, especially on like ESPN Sports Center. And I mean, you were just like a scoring at will. And I mean, like, who is this woman, you know? Well, so, you know I remember, well, we didn't have cell phones when I was in college until my senior year. I think it was my sophomore year at Tennessee, and I remember my dorm room phone ringing, and I pick up the phone, and it's Coach Summit, and she's like, oh my God, you've just been named like uh, ESPN uh, Player of the Week or, or something, and I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, they've never named a female wow. <laughs> Player of the Week. It was like such a big deal, but I just think, you know, I went to Tennessee. I was a New Yorker. Um, I just really worked hard. I had a great time. It was an adjustment period for me. But it's, it's sometimes it just it just felt like so surreal. Like I mean, unreal. It was just, yeah, it was like unreal. Like we had so much success. It was like a it was like I was just in a daze. Yeah, but I'll tell you, uh, kudos to you, young lady, because uh, she might have been in a daze out on uh, I don't know off the court, but not not for long. Because again, you're also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, and yeah. again, so obviously you know you must have. Uh, you must have been doing quite well in, in college and, again, picked as one of the five greatest players in the SEC of the past 25 years. Uh, uh, this I did not see, and, I, and it, it probably is coming up uh, very shortly. Um, are you eligible for the, uh, the uh, uh, Hall of Fame yet? Is that, is that uh, take? Well, I, have, um, I think you have, to, you have to have retired for five years. Okay. And I have retired for five years, but still, I, I'm too young. They'll probably get me when I'm in my 40s. <laughs> oh, I, well, I, I know Rebecca Lobo, who I believe is like in her early 40s. She got in a couple of years ago, and again, another outstanding player. Now, did you ever play against her either in the, uh, you missed her in the in the college by a year, correct? Um, yes, but I played against her uh, in the WNBA. When she was either with the Liberty or maybe late, she came um, to the yeah, Connecticut. she was with the Liberty. I she remember. was with a team in Houston, too, but that was at that point. That was at the end. Yeah, she had a lot of, a lot of injuries. I came when she was uh, in New York still. Yeah, the Liberty, yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I thought of the upcoming interview when I saw uh, Katie Douglas, who uh, you either played with or uh, or against at various points, she just announced her retirement, and you're starting to see. Okay, you know, again, it's like any sport. The, you know, older guard moves out, and then uh, there's, especially in sports. I mean, you see it even in in uh, in football, basketball. There's only so many slots, and let me tell you, you got people leaving after their you know freshman year, junior year. That. You know, it's it's crazy. You know, I mean, going back to even we talked, it might have been off air about Manu Ball, who right. um, I got to meet when uh, when he was at the University of Bridgeport. Of course, had a outstanding uh, pro uh, career NBA, tremendous blocker. He was from Sudan, I believe. Yeah. Um, seven 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 six, some crazy crazy height and stuff. And now, for some reason, I don't know. I, I thought you were uh, you were taller. Uh, you're taller than me. You're six two, correct? Yeah, you haven't gotten to the point like I am where you start to shrink. Yeah, you know, someday you'll be at an old timers game. Hey, she used to be. Uh, she looks like she's about five ten now. But anyway. I know you started to shrink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, unless unless you do like Arnold and get those those lifts in your shoes, and he always he always looks like Atlas. Some of your career highlights for the uh, the uh, the viewers: uh, WNBA Rookie of the Year, nineteen ninety nine. Six-time WNBA All-Star, two-time uh, WNBA Rebounding Champion, Scoring Champion, Sullivan Award, two-time Naismith Award, that would have been uh, during your college years, 
Yes. And again, as I said, uh, Olympic gold medalist. I think, I think that's a first for us. We've talked about a few gold medalists, but this is the first one uh, here on Studio 411. Now, um, you are in your late 30s now. Uh, ever entertain the chance of uh, maybe making another comeback or no? Um, you know, I, I kind of <clears throat> thought about it. It's, it's crossed my mind to walk away from the game on my own uh, accord. Uh, the reason I left the game of basketball was, was because I had tore my Achilles. Okay. And as I was rehabbing to get back, I tore it again. So I was kind of like deflated um, emotionally. But and I work out every day. My body feels good. So I've thought about it in my head. And my friends are like, I think you should do it. Even if, if it's for a half a season, I think, you know, the game owes you this. So. I mean, I can still play, um, but I need to make a decision quickly. <laughs> let me let me give you a, a little piece of advice. You better call the Connecticut Sun right away. <laughs> uh, was it Ann Donovan? <clears throat> they've got, uh, and especially with Katie Douglas retiring now, you know they they've got a couple of injuries. See, I, oh, I thought when Katie Douglas was playing for the Connecticut Sun, I thought she was with the Indiana Fever. No, but I thought she she had she was with oh. them, went to the Fever, and then she was going to play with them again, I believe, and then she uh, she injuries again took their toll, and she announced her retirement. Oh, yeah? okay, I yeah. had no idea. Oh yeah, no, she was outstanding. But so they got they got, and they have some, one other player who's out for the year with some major injury so <clears throat> i'm telling you, you didn't hear it from me but i think i think you need to make a phone call after this interview so right. <laughs> um tell me now a, a little bit about your upbringing we talked about again growing up in queens uh <clears throat> you mentioned to me off air your mom as as uh, i assume always is a big part of your life equally yes. uh grandmother was was a major influence on your life so tell me a little bit about your upbringing well, you know, well, my grandmother actually raised me um, from age and I struggled um, with alcoholism. So I went to go live with my grandmother and I was saying, you know, my parents always loved me, but they were just battling their own demons. And so my grandmother, she's the person in my life that taught me that discipline, that, that structure and what it was to, you know, be, be stable and stay focused. So. Without her, I don't know where I would be on the face, right. of, the face of the earth because I was traumatized. Mem imagine being, I was like taking, take, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, you said the magic word, traumatized. There we go. You win the, Do we have a prize for Shamiqua? I don't know. What's going on? I'm so sorry. Imagine being. That's okay. Um, we had a fax machine go off one time with another okay. guest. So, you know, business calls. You know what I'm saying? I'm but, sorry. Go ahead. I, have this, I have this new Apple watch, and that's what happened. But. Um, it, you know, I was taken away from my parents um, during an incident um, by the by the state, and so my grandmother had to raise me, and it was tough. It was traumatic. I had, you know, the depression, the temper tantrums, and my grandmother really helped me, you know, heal during that. I hear it. Yeah, um, and then at one point, um, I, I believe it was what during your uh, already WNBA career. Then your your grandma uh, passed, correct? Yes. So that that was a big a big jolt for you. Well, in 2002, it's just like my life just changed. Um, you know, I left my grandmother's environment, protective environment, to go to you know Coach Summit, and I I just was used to that structure and discipline. Imagine being like the face of women's basketball, and you know the way DC embraced me. My face is everywhere, um, billboards. You know, the fanfare is is ridiculous. And I'm trying to deal with that and, you know, just get, get, get acclimated. And next thing you know, like, it was like a rug was slipped um, from under my feet. And, and I didn't recover. It, I, I really sunk into, a, like, a really deep depression, and it really um, affected my life. Now, in those days, uh, 99 through 2004, so at that period, you mentioned D.C. You were playing for the uh, Washington Mystics of the yeah. WNBA. Um, yeah. Again, you know, it, it's kind of funny. I, I see it uh, even with some of the players that have uh, played, for instance, for Coach Oriem at UConn. Uh, again, like Coach Summit, you know, very structured, very, you know, this is how we do things, whatever. Um, when you get to all of a sudden the pros, you know, a lot of them don't necessarily have the same type of success or because obviously it's a team game, not an individual game. And right. even you yourself now, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you didn't, were not part of a WNBA championship during yeah, your time, correct? It's, it, yeah, it's very, it's very uh, tough, you know, yeah. because 
if you used to like we played for such dominant coaches, you know, Geno's and the Pats, and they control their environments. You know, they they implement that structure. You know, when I went to the league, I'm like, okay, you know, there's a new coach. I think I played in my time in D.C. Uh, like six different coaches. Uh, when I look around, it's such, you know, it's women on my team, you know, 21. Uh, you can't tell people what to do. It's, they, the coaches can't control the environment as much. So, you know, you could be work, working so hard. You could have a teammate that stays out all night, like Michael Jordan said Dennis Rodman did. But unlike Dennis Rodman, they might not show up to get those 20 rebounds. Right. So, you know, it, it, it was definitely uh, an environment which you had, like, a lot of different variables. And also with today's environment, whereas even going back to the days at Tennessee, where, as you said, you didn't have a cell phone until maybe your senior year. You know, yes. again, it, it's kind of like a lot of us that went to, went to school back in the day. Mm-hmm. You know, I was talking to a, a guest we had on recently uh, who's, a, who's a, a, a world-renowned swimmer. And they're like, you know, she's talking about writing letters and everything else. And now it's like, you know, and that's great. I mean, you know, uh, someone I knew once said, hey, you know, it's once nice once in a while to get something in the mailbox and, you it's know, from letter. someone you love and read instead of this instant gratification. Uh, now, now people know every move you make, but at the same time, you know, that also kind of infringes on yeah. structure, on mm-hmm. discipline, and I think also sometimes you know, is not always a healthy thing for any of us, not not just yourself. Um, Shamiqua Holzclaw joining us for the hour here on uh, Studio 411. Of course, uh, a world-renowned basketball player uh, with uh, the Tennessee Lady Vols as well as uh, several WNBA teams uh, in her time. Uh, you mentioned earlier, and we talked about uh, joking about the, the New York Knicks, whatever, there was a great... Um, uh, a great piece of a, uh, a magazine, and I'm, I'm blanking on it right here. And I saw the image of you with a Knicks jersey. Uh, and, and at the time, I believe you were like the first like woman or whatever, the first female athlete to appear on the cover of Slam magazine. And the, the quote was, she was pictured in a New York Knicks jersey, implying that perhaps she was good enough to play in the NBA. They could use you now as well. Let me tell you. <laughs> so you, so I got a whole master plan. You call Alan, you call Alan, and we'll we'll have you hook up with those those coaches. Believe me. Right. I, I need to call Alan Houston. You know, Tennessee alumna. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Yeah, yeah. Good player in his day. Yeah. The, the, but yeah, yeah, the Slam magazine was big. I think to this day, I'm the only female to ever be on the uh, only woman to be on the cover of that magazine. So. That was a great honor. Um, honor. I remember when the guy that created Slam Magazine talked to me. He said, you know, the reason that he did it was because of, like, the love for, for, for New York City, you know, how I took the women's game to the next level. And he just really wanted to just, you know, pay me homage and respect. So I appreciate that. Uh, t- talk to me a little bit about when you were um, uh, on the Olympic team again. That, uh, you know, the in, like, let's say two minutes' time, the... Uh, the experience from walking, uh, you know, at the beginning of the games to the closing to everything. That must have been a whirlwind experience. Wow. Like I said, it's just amazing to be amongst the world's best. Like, I'm standing there, you know, walking in there, and I'm like, I am. It's, it's, it's 10, 12 players on the team. I am one of the best in the world. Like, all your hard work has paid off. And it was it was it was it was amazing. I was just glad my grandmother could be there. My mom. You worked so hard as a kid, and those are things you like to dream about. You and know, the, and this about. was in Sydney, Australia, correct? Yeah, and so. so it's like front and center stage to to walk through the athletes' um, like housing area and to see Marion Jones. Like you're like, wow, that's Marion Jones. You know, to to continue walking and you see Carl Lewis, you know, former Olympian there. You know, talking to Michael Johnson, it's just like the best of the best. Oh yeah, that uh, you're naming a, you know, a who's who of people. Uh, anyone who doesn't <laughs> doesn't know those folks, believe me, must have been born like about uh, eight years ago. You know, it's a, uh, and even then, you know, from a historical standpoint, you know, what people should keep up uh, up with that kind of stuff. Uh, I wanted to mention too. <clears throat> Uh, Shamiqua wrote uh, her uh, autobiography, and I'm sure there'll be more more chapters forthcoming in another book. Breaking through, beating the odds. 
shot after shot. And again, that uh, talks about, again, uh, some of the uh, depression uh, issues that you uh, suffer during your professional basketball career. Um, was that something, again, you had alluded to that during the structured years in college, did, did you like ever looking back say, well, you know what, I, I might have had symptoms again, because uh, again, I think with each person it's different, you know, as far as how it manifests itself. Well, for me, it's been a, a life, lifetime uh, battle with it. I actually experienced it as a kid, and my grandmother, what she did when she sent me, I was really struggling around the time my parents left the household. I was struggling, and so my grandmother sent me to a counselor um, who said you know, I was really suffering from um, depression. I went to Allentine at the time for kids that are dealing with struggle with alcohol. Like, my grandmother really tried to... I mean, it, well, she did, She I can't say try, she really did give me that support around me. But the thing is, you know, when you're good at something, like I was good at sports, so I was always gone. It was something that I just sweeped under the rug because it was like, I have AAU, I have this, I look happy, I'm doing these things. But what I started to realize is like, okay, I'm having all this success, I'm a good student, but when not sometimes when I'm by myself, like I have these thoughts or I'm suffering in silence, but I felt like I couldn't tell anyone because... I was going to be deemed, you know, like the people say, crazy, or people were going to think I was, like, weak. So I never really said anything about it. And I remember experiencing it in college. I actually called Coach Summit, and we met outside her office. And I said, Coach, like, all these amazing things are happening in my life, but it's just, like, I, I, I just feel, like, really down. Like, I, I don't know, and it overpowers me. And I remember her saying, Shamiqua, you just have to try to do things that, that make you happy. So I started seeing a sports psychologist in college. But hey, you know what? Again, we're winning championships. We got a game the next day. I got to get 20 points and 10 rebounds. Again, I start sweeping. And that was like what I did. Like I became a people pleaser. I can't let anyone know my little, my, my little secret. Right. So let me continue to, to push it under the rug. And what happened is like it finally uh, came to a head and I couldn't control it anymore. And I found myself in DC, like, you know, I, I had like a mental breakdown and it was probably one of the, the worst experiences of my life. But still, during that, I, I, I got the help that I needed, but I was just like so embarrassed. You know, you just don't understand. It just, it, it, it overtakes your body. And when you don't want to talk about it or you feel like you can't, it's really like you're living, you're, 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 you're I don't want to say sweeping it, but you're just suffering in silence. That's what it is. Right. Well, mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, we certainly, during the course of this interview, we appreciate you, uh, you know, touching upon it. Because, again, I, as I'm sure you would agree, uh, every case is different. Every person is different. Um, I think we've all had, you know, mm -hmm. our, our demons, our battles, uh, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, depression or funks if you want to call it and again uh, you know i think it's important to uh you know to obviously seek help and um in recent years now you have uh, uh founded the uh, shamiqua holes claw foundation which again promotes mental health while educating and training individuals right. uh based out of atlanta georgia now is that uh, your home base pretty much now Oh uh, yes, Atlanta. Atlanta yeah. is, and you know, the foundation. Uh, my main objective is I just want people to like really learn to own their experience, accept their journey, and like use the challenges to like drive a, a positive outcome. Like I, like so many times, and it's really um, caused some negative effects in my life. Um, you know, having like mania episodes and not being able to control it. And finally, you know, I realized, okay, the doctors realized that I was suffering from bipolar disorder. So with the proper treatment, it's like really changed my life. Like I know that I have to go to therapy and I know that I have to take my medication. So I just, I'm a big advocate for that because when I was playing basketball, I thought that everything was just fitness. Like I can work out that stress. Mm -hmm. And again, when you start to feel really good about yourself, a lot of times, people that struggle with mental health illnesses, we don't want to take our medication because we think we're feeling good. And I was just, I was, just, it was just like up and down, up and down, up and down, until it got out of control for me. And I just feared that, you know, I was going to lose myself. You know, I was going to lose my life because in 2006, like I sat in a hotel in LA after a suicide attempt. 
and it was like the scariest day for me, the, the scariest um, episode ever. And I just really, really, really wanted to just focus on like changing my life, you know, and making sure that I did everything that I could to better myself. And at that point in time, you were playing for the uh, L.A. Sparks of the WNBA. Yes. And as we, we talked earlier, perhaps even off camera, uh, you said it earlier, too. Again, you've got, you've got the, everything on a, on a nice silver platter, not handed to you. You worked very hard, you know, double-doubles every game. I mean, I, looking at stats, you're averaging like double-doubles for an entire season. I mean, you're like the, you know, Michael, Oscar, Robertson all rolled <laughs> into one. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and it's like... Uh, Again, sometimes it's it's just not not enough, you know what I'm saying? And I think, yeah, you, you've obviously had to um, do the things that you've done. Uh, and again, I'm sure there's been setbacks, and there's been, you know, and then that's part of. I guess it's it's a lifelong uh, lifelong uh, struggle. We won't call it a battle, you know. Yeah, it's it's a it's a struggle, you know. It's a it's a uh, illness, but. It's something, you know, I wake up every morning, I'm ready to tackle it, I'm ready to fi fight yeah. it, and I'm ready to, you know, follow the protocol, whatever you say, that I have to, you know, I have to, like I said, do the therapy, I have to do the work, you have right. to do the work. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's kind of like what you had to do, not only with Scholastic, but also athletically, yeah. I'm sure coach would, uh, any of the coaches, Summit, uh, you know, uh, John Wooden, any, anybody, past, present, and future, <laughs> you have to, you, you hit it on the, the, the nail on the head, in my opinion, you have yeah. to do the work, it, not, it, uh, whether it's schoolwork, uh, uh, physical, mental preparation for a game, as yeah. well as, you know, outside of the game as well. Yes, we, yeah. we all do. It's funny, like, you know, my friends always tell me, oh my God, you're such a strong person, you're, you're so resilient. And that's the only way that I know. Like nothing's gonna take me down. Like okay, I'm hitting the ground. I gotta bounce back up. You yeah. gotta keep pushing forth. And you know that's the message that I want everybody to know. I know it's hard. Like I I, I talked to a, a lot of vets, and this guy once, and it was actually in a documentary that was released about me. He said, you know, I came back and I was so down. I put that 45 to my head, and I wanted to take my life. And I'm like, you know, I think that I have problems. People have it worse. And I gave him a hug. And I'm like, you know, that's the kind of conversations that we have to have. We have to share so that we can all, you know, share our voice to help, um, you know, eliminate the stigma associated with this mental health thing. Sure. Uh, here's a stat I just learned. Again, incredible stat. Uh, I think uh, one out of every 10 uh, act, not active, uh, veteran that was in any any wars, even those that are going back to World War II, but obviously Korea, Vietnam, any of the other conflicts, one out of ten uh, homeless in this country, which is, you know, just, so again, and then you, you factor that into the equation with everything going on, and you got, you know, uh, PTSD and all these other things that back in the day no one, you know, we wondered why you always hear stories about, oh, well, uh, you know, this World War II veteran or Vietnam veteran, yeah, they never really talked much about it. Well, first of all, who can blame them, like right. the gentleman you spoke of, but then some of them were able to just kind of minimize it and conduct day-to-day -day lives. How many are not, and then on top of it, are living, you know, like day-to-day -day or, or, you know, without without a roof over their head. So, yes. as, yes. as you said, yeah, you know, and... Uh, um, uh, again, your your slogan and core initiative with the foundation is, quote, mentally driven, which aims to inspire those suffering from or supporting those with mental health obstacles to own their experience, accept their journey, and use the challenges to drive a, pos a positive outcome. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I came, up, I came up with the whole mentally driven thing um, because when I was really struggling and going through a hard time, um, I used to jog like three to six miles a day. Like it was like something, the only thing I can do like to, to get myself moving. And I would say to myself, like, I gotta stay mentally driven. I gotta stay mentally driven. And um, that's how I came up with that with that slogan. You know, you gotta, you gotta stay the course, you gotta push forth. And that's what I tell the kids when we have the clinics or the camps. It's like, everybody's like, you know, you're running around, what's mentally driven, what's mentally driven, no matter what you do, whether it's schoolwork, whether it's, you know, um, you know, dealing with adversity, you, is you have to just focus in and lock in and just continue to move forward. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of someone uh, that I've known a little bit, not well, but again, what you said reminded me uh, that um, 
again, dealing whether it's uh, drug abuse or depression or alcoholism, I find a, a thread that goes through it is um, almost doing things to excess. And this particular person was the, the jogging. It was like kind of jogging, jogging, jogging. It was almost like that's what, what almost kept them from the edge, you know. And then later on I found out, well, guess what? They stopped jogging and then next thing you know, you know, the drinking started again or the this started again. And again, these are like, I guess they're helpful, but at the same time, as yeah. you said, it's in the therapy, the, uh, maybe we diagnose things better now. I don't know, because now yeah, it's, we, it's what we do is, uh, is everybody starts to develop. Um, if you're not learned good coping mechanisms, you start to develop bad ones. Like there was time when I was trying to deal and cope, um, uh, when I couldn't, you start some, I started like drinking a little bit more. I wasn't a big drinker. And so I'm starting to have like, you know, a couple of drinks a night to kind of ease things. Some mm -hmm. people move on to harder stuff, drugs, you know, and it just spirals out of control. So, you know, everybody's trying to get that release. Yeah. Um, just to touch on uh, her for a, a moment, um, how have you kept in touch as best given the situation with uh, Coach Summit and her family? Oh, definitely. You know, Coach Summit is like one of my family members. I love her to death. Um, you know, she's been an important part of my life. And it's been really hard for me to see her deal with her own um, battle. Uh, it's something that you just don't expect. You know, um, a person uh, of her caliber is, is such a strong mind, strong will, who's given us so many to, to have to deal with uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. It's like her and Dean Smith, like the greatest two of the greatest basketball minds, you know, sure. just sort of just losing it. Yeah. Um, it's really been hard for the Lady Ball family and just people around the world. I mean, she's just, she is women's basketball. Like, Gino's done a great job, but Coach Summit, Pat Summit built this. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I, I just felt the roof shake. Look. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I give Gino his credit. He's an amazing coach. But if you look at the history of the game, Cat Summit fought for for women. She she's the like push for women to get a lot of change came about. So she's 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 the she she broke the ground. <laughs> yeah, some some great coaches. I'm sure you could enlighten me even further. But a couple that uh, come to mind: uh, C. Vivian Stringer, uh, uh, been uh, you know coaching for years. Um, yes. The woman, I know she was coaching back when you were at Tennessee. Uh, she passed away of cancer about, I don't know, uh, half a dozen. Sue Say again? Yeah. Sue, Sue Gunner at a... No, no, it was, um, oh God, uh, I, I'm going to think of it about 2 a.m. in the morning. She she even kept on, you know, coaching after her cancer was... Oh, oh Kay Yao. Kay Yao, yeah, that yes, definitely. Yes, I mean, she was yes, like... Yes. Like the you know John Wooden of uh, you know women's basketball yeah, coaching. Yeah, I mean, a lot of great ones. Yeah, oh yeah, tremendous. But uh, um, now uh, Coach Summit, uh, I, last I heard, she was almost kind of like Coach Emeritus. She would go to some of the games, whatever. Yes. But but obviously with with uh, that uh, very very tough tough uh, disease. That, uh, it is. You know, she has her, her good and bad days. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the mornings, uh, you know, she's like alive. Sometimes as the day progresses progresses you know it gets a little worse and you gotta understand when coach summit walks in the building everybody wants her attention oh, so sure. it's like a little it can be a little overwhelming sometimes yeah so everybody's just like just really tries tries to protect her and you know be there and just sit with her and just just talk with her and it's funny last time i saw her she's like host claw host claw, host claw. <laughs> you know what did you like why don't you get back out there in the court like is your achilles Better yet. And there I'm you just go. Like, oh my God. There you go. See, Connecticut Sun, make that phone call. <laughs> Knicks, make that phone call. You got your choice. You got your choice of many teams. Even the Nets could use you. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but that's. But you know what's amazing that, and and I have not been, um, uh, I guess, fortunate in some ways, really, to have anybody that I'm uh, close with that has battled Alzheimer's, but. Again, it's just, I think we have this image, again, it's kind of like a stigma, just like we talked about mental health. Well, say it slower, or repeat it several times, or say it softer, or say it louder, or, you know, play that song from like 40 years ago that was their wedding song. There's no guarantee with any of that, you know. I think we think that it's like, uh, you know, something is going to click. 
All you can do is hope. Well, you just said good days, bad days, and eventually it all becomes kind of, you know, kind of regressive, you know. Right. Uh, um, we talked ab uh, before about the, uh, the book breaking through, beating the odd shot after shot. And uh, within the last year, year and a half, you'll correct me on this, mind game, the unquiet. I love that because I thought at first it was unique. And I said, oh, the unquiet journey of Shamiqua Holesclaw, a movie that took three years to make uh, in the remaining moments. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. Oh, um, well, I was contacted by Rick Goldsmith, who is the best friend of my agent. And Rick is a filmmaker out of Berkeley, uh, California. He's been Academy Award nominated and, and really makes social uh, conscious films. And he just read my story in the New York Times while he was searching. He reads the New York Times every day, searching for his next story. And he fell upon mine and just thought it was really um, interesting and met with me and said, hey, you know what? After meeting with you, reading about you, I have to do this, this documentary on you. Um, we had our like ups and downs along the way because you know nothing's perfect. You know, you're I'm opening up my life to the world. You know, while still going through my treatment and my and my process. So it's days where I wanted to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't. It's just it's, it's too much. But I would take my breaks and I said I need to do this. I need to let people know that, that what people go through dealing with this. You know, I, I needed to, to show the world this, that it's not something that you can just uh, pray away. Um, it's not something that you can just go work out and get rid of. Like, you have to really formulate a, a game plan like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's unbelievable. Like, it really takes you on a, a, a great journey. I think it gives people a lot of um, insight. And most importantly, it's, it's going to save a lot of lives and, 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 and change people's minds. There you go. And as you said, took three years to make for yes. all, all the reasons and then some. So again, uh, I definitely, I know I'm going to uh, look, uh, look for that. That's uh, great, great to hear. And uh, uh, again, um, what's going on with the foundation? Uh, I know you have a lot of events that go on and uh, yeah, constantly you know, trying to make a difference. Like a, right now, it's like a lot of uh, great things happening because of the film. And we're just trying to get, you know, it's, it's fairly new. So just trying to get a better structure and restructure things so that we're able to give more to people. My uh, ultimate thing is be able to give scholarships to kids that need therapy because as I um, go around in different communities to speak, every, not everybody can afford um, $150 to get treated. Not everybody can afford at times $50. So it's like, hey, can I raise money to help these families out? And that's just my main goal, and to supply um, camps. Like, I love sports. Basketball is like, has been my bread and butter. What I want to do is combine basketball to bring them in with life skills. Right. So we've got to start young. We have to, like, change the way these kids think, and but we got to start with the grassroots. Yeah. Well, that goes kind of back uh, as adults to what we talked about with, again, the NBA, the NFL, two of the worst offenders uh that when it comes to you know financial advice you know the, all these gentlemen i don't know i can't speak about the wnba but but again as my wife always says oh listen to those wnba players look how they play ball she goes i can't watch that nba and look how well they speak and look at the guys they can barely put two words together i yes dear yes dear i just nod i just nod my head but i get where she's coming from you know yeah. but with the w with the nba rather in the nfl like what you're talking about is, again, at the high school level for anybody, at the college level, but certainly for these athletes, how to manage their money and also their life. It, it, it has to start like when they're young. I mean, I think every high school, I'm gonna say high school, uh, really should have a, a program in place to take these kids through financial literacy, dealing with stress, because like you mentioned earlier, we live in that, um, everybody, these kids want that quick fix. Right. You know, they're not used to rolling up the sleeves and, and, and working hard. We're a part of that generation where everybody gets a trophy on the team. Participation. Oh, uh, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No or, child left behind. Like, yeah. when I played, when you walk away with that trophy, it's because you were the best player. You right. were like first, second, or third. Now or or the, or the other one is uh, not only the, the trophies for everybody, but have you ever heard this one? You know, the kid might like pick a toothpick off the ground. Good job. 
you know. Oh, God. <laughs> Good job. I mean, like, wait a minute. Did we find a cure for a disease? I mean, that's great that you did that, but let's not, you know, coddle. And I know I'll get I'll get in trouble for this, but it's like you know, it, like you 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 said it, and I'm glad that you say it. It says, you know, rewarding is great, but let's let's, you know. It's kind of like the uh, no child left behind. I don't want to see anybody left behind, but let's not, you know, if you've got like an A student and some people like me, for a lot of reasons, I was probably a C plus student, you know what I'm saying? B minus if I was lucky. Why? Because maybe I didn't know how to apply myself, but at the same time, let's not drag everybody else behind me because we got to wait for this kid to catch up. Sometimes right. it's not happening. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting to catch up. <laughs> Oh, you know, I was the same way, but that's that's something that really has to change, and you know, we, we, we can change that if we just, I mean, it's like the parents and the teachers, everybody coming together, so, you know, hopefully we start seeing seeing some changes, because now, boy, these kids are, are spoiled, I mean, they walk in the gym, I'm like, oh my God, they're going to be great players, they have the headphones, the sleeves, the $150, $200 pair of shoes, and can't play a lick. <laughs> and uh, tell me they're not dribbling and texting with the other hand. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best one is a show I was watching where uh, they were so bored that w two of them were standing next to each other and they're texting each other the alphabet. I'm like, you know what? Oh, oh, I'm God. having flashbacks <laughs> to my old man. He's like, ooh, boom. <laughs> Down for the count, but of course, you know, anyway. Uh, Shamiqua Holesclaw joining us for uh, a few more minutes here on Studio 411. A basketball superstar to the nth degree uh, who's been kind enough to uh, share the, uh, the stigma that uh, she has gone through and continues to uh, battle successfully regarding mental illness. At the same time, uh, doing what she can to uh, uh, educate and enlighten folks uh, it's amazing that as we talked earlier um, we're in the 21st century and you would think we were in the 18th century that it's still a stigma as you said earlier sweep it under the rug don't talk about it you know don't don't you know it's gonna do this gonna do that it, it's just crazy you know that that people still feel that way on yeah, so many yeah. levels it's, um, you know, a lot of it, just, uh, it's, you know, as far as with our athletes, too, especially our male athletes, you know, it's just like they're tough, they're strong. And I think now you're starting to see, like, you know, you have Brandon Marshall speak up and say that he was struggling and, you know, some others. And now you see people, well, wow, you know, other men coming forth and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with this illness. Um, you know, I think it takes this... Honestly, like the celebrities, more celebrities like are coming out and saying this. And so these are people that the kids look up to. So I know like a lot of organizations like the International Bipolar um, Organizations, which I just got an award with, like their whole theme is always athletes because those are the, the athletes are the ones that are bringing people like to the table and helping people like understand what it's going through. Because if you see these guys, they're out in the field, all right? They're just like crushing people, like dunking people you gotta you gotta think like something up here sometime with the concussions like something is going on up there like, exactly it is shamiko give us the uh, the website where folks uh, as well as myself can become further enlightened uh oh yeah it's uh um well it's my name shamiko hostclaw at foundation.org very good and again just uh, a, a wealth of information i can't thank you enough uh, gracious well, that you, you were to have us uh, join uh, or have you join us for the hour uh, again the movie mind game the unquiet journey of Shamiqua Holesclaw uh, the book breaking through beating the odd shot after shot Shamiqua Holesclaw Foundation we're out of time Shamiqua thanks and we'll be in thanks, touch man. soon you and take you care. stick Thank with you. us and uh, we'll see you next time on another edition of Studio 411 bye for now <laughs>